Okay, I think uh, we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is the National Human Genome Research Institute's webinar on ancient genetic clues into modern human disease. I am Alexander Arguello. I am a program director in the Division of Genome Sciences for NHGRI. Um, before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, so this is being recorded. It will be recorded and then archived and posted on our website. Um, we have the chat disabled, but we have the Q&A uh, enabled. So for all those attendees, uh, you can enter any questions at any point at any time during the webinar. Uh, we'll have time to address some of the audience questions, uh, but then panelists may also address uh, those questions in the chat. Uh, if we do not get to your questions, the questions will be archived, um, so be part of the record and we can get to them at a, a later point in time. So uh, the National Human Genome Research Institute supports research, um, fundamental research in genomics to advance human health. Um, a few years ago, we sort of established our uh, strategic uh, vision and what the forefront or the future of genomics would look like. And I just, relevant to this webinar, want to highlight some of those uh, objectives and goals um, from that strategic vision. Uh, this uh, included guiding principles and values for human genomics, uh, including striving for global diversity in all aspects of genomics research, committing to the systematic inclusion of ancestrally diverse and underrepresented individuals in major genomic studies, as well as provide conceptual research framing that consistently examines the role of both genomic um, and non-genomic contributors to human health and disease. Uh, we also want to sustain and improve uh, the foundation for genomics uh, through looking at structure and function of the genome, uh, which includes using evolutionary and comparative, comparative genomic approaches to uh, increase our understanding of genome function. And we're also interested in compelling genomics, re genomics research projects uh, that include uh, determining the genetic architecture of most human diseases and traits, and to um, begin uh, designing studies that include diverse ancestral populations that enable the scientific discoveries that will enable genomic medicine for all. So as part of this strategic vision, recently an HGRI uh, has been putting together a program in uh, complex traits genetics or uh, the genetic architecture of, of complex traits. Uh, last year, we had a workshop uh, in which we brought people together from fields of population and statistical genetics and genetic epidemiology and sort of looked at the current uh, advances that we have in understanding complex traits genetics. This webinar is sort of part of that effort, uh, but we also have, uh, starting next week, a, a webinar series in complex traits genetics uh, with our first uh, series introducing uh, the series, uh, looking back at uh, Richard Lewinton's retrospective uh, about the his variance decomposition critique. Uh, so this is a reanalysis of variance and reanalysis of causes. Uh, this will be presented by Rasmus Winter at UC Santa Cruz, who's a philosopher uh, biology, who's written uh, extensively on Lewinton's work. So that will set off the series um, every couple months or so, looking at different uh, current topics in complex traits genetics. We also have a, a couple standing notice of opportunities uh, for new methods uh, for uh, genetic architecture complex traits. Uh, these are R01s and R21s, uh, standard receipt dates. Uh, these are uh, currently out on the streets. And so uh, to advance our sort of strategic uh, vision. Uh, occasionally, we have these sort of informational webinars in which we seek uh, community input to get a sort of survey of the field, identify any potential gaps. Um, and that's where this uh, uh, webinar comes in. So this is a question posed recently by Carl Zimmer of the New York Times, who asked, is the future of medicine hidden in ancient DNA? 
And this was in response to a couple of high profile papers uh, using ancient DNA uh, to look at uh, the sort of spatial distribution and prevalence of different uh, diseases and having ancient DNA provide a few clues into why that might be the case. Now, usually um, uh, when we think of ancient DNA, or at least the type of ancient DNA research that the NIH and also the uh, uh, NSF has supported, it has a lot to do with learning about human evolutionary history, demography, um, uh, evolution. Uh, but if we're going to use ancient DNA to learn more about modern human traits and human disease, something that the NIH's many institutes and centers are interested in, um, how can we uh, support that uh, work? So this is a sort of some graphics on the current representation of genetic diversity, diversity in existing uh, genomic data sets. On the left, this is from sort of the GWAS diversity tracker. Uh, on the right is from uh, NOMAD. Uh, it's well known now that there's underrepresentation of many communities, uh, global communities, in sort of genomic and genetic data sets uh, currently. And there's a lot of work going on to sort of rectify this and increase diversity uh, of these data sets. And sort of this sort of bias in genetic data sets has opened up a lot of interesting questions about differences across populations and um why uh, certain genetic effects uh, may differ across populations, the portability of polygenic scores. So a lot of active research area into um, global representation of uh, genetic diversity and what does that mean for understanding uh, disparities, uh, inequalities in, in health and disease. Now, this is sort of from the Allen Ancient DNA resource, and this is the current published genome-wide ancient DNA uh, data. So for th from the existing populations, a lot of the data comes from Western Europe and Northern Europe. There's a little bit better here in terms of covering Eurasia, but there's still a lot of underrepresentation, especially in the Global South um, and the African continent. And so one of the sort of main motivating factors for this uh, webinar is if ancient DNA um, and ancient DNA were sort of operationally defining as sort of uh, DNA coming from uh, over older than 500 years old um, and historical DNA uh, being younger than that, um, if we're going to use this ancient DNA and historical DNA to advance our understanding of human health and disease related traits, we do not want to uh, put ourselves in the same situation in which disparities and underrepresentation of global communities is going to cause a disparity in potential application or insights of uh, ancient DNA data. And so what can we do now as we build up these resources uh, so that we can conduct research in a responsible and ethical frame uh, way that will allow um, global populations to benefit from any type of this research. So that's sort of the where we're coming from in terms of gathering uh, researchers in related areas to sort of understand where we stand and where we're going in the near future. So this is the agenda for today. Um, after my introduction, we will have uh, the panelists introduce themselves. So they will uh, state their names or affiliations and give us a, a few sentences about their primary research interests. Uh, then we'll have three uh, separate sessions on, on three topics. Uh, the first one will be sort of just a survey of where we currently stand in terms of uh, ancient DNA research, what sort of um, are the limitations in generating ancient DNA data? Um, what is the distribution and sources of those data? Um, after each session, we'll have uh, so a few minutes for addressing the audience Q&A. Uh, after the first session, we'll have a break. Then we'll get into the next two sessions. The second one will be ethical frameworks for diversifying ancient and historical DNA resources, 
and research. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of close scrutiny in the human genetics community about the way that we approach our research, especially when we're engaging with um, underrepresented or minoritized communities. Um, how can we avoid some of those same uh, mistakes when we're doing ancient and historical DNA work? Uh, in session three, uh, we'll be exploring really how far can ancient DNA data get us in understanding modern uh, diseases and traits. Is this something that only applies to a very narrow set of specific traits, or is this something going to have a, a broader impact in really exploring um, how far uh, these types of data can get us into understanding the prevalence and distribution of different traits and diseases in existing populations? Then we'll have a few minutes for closing remarks, um, and we'll end. Uh, after this webinar, as I mentioned, we'll have this recorded and posted um, on our website. We will also uh, seek additional input from other uh, researchers in the field and provide a sort of written summary and, and public report of everything that we discussed here and some of the major themes that we see. And that, again, will also be posted on our website. So that's it for me in terms of some background and introduction. And now I will invite all the, the panelists to turn on their cameras. And we will do some uh, brief introductions. Um, and I'll just call on people based on how you appear on my screen. Uh, and Sarah. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks so much for organizing this important webinar. Uh, I actually don't study ancient DNA. My, I should first introduce myself. My name is Sarah Tishkoff. I'm a professor in genetics and biology at the University of Pennsylvania and director of the Penn Center for Global Genomics and Health Equity. And uh, my research has focused on studying modern populations in Africa. Uh, together with African collaborators, we integrate field work in Africa, functional genomics wet lab work, and computational analyses to better understand human evolutionary history in Africa, how people have adapted to different environments, and also uh, genetic risk factors uh, for certain diseases, uh, many of which show health disparities. Um, but occasionally, we do use ancient DNA as a comparative analysis. Thanks, Sarah. Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica Thompson. I'm an assistant professor at Yale University, and I'm an archaeologist and biological anthropologist. So I've been involved in ancient DNA work primarily in southern Central Africa, and especially Malawi, where we've recovered a number of uh, sets of human remains and been able to successfully extract ancient DNA from them and learn some pretty remarkable things about um, forager, mostly, um, interactions in the past, and that's through collaborations primarily with the Reich Lab. Mansa. Good morning. I am Mansa Raghavan. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Human Genetics at the University of Chicago, where my lab um, essentially studies um, evolution processes that have shaped genetic variation in global human populations. Uh, we do this by bringing together um, data sets that are ancient and, and present day contemporary populations. Um, our lab goes sort of all the way from field work to wet lab work to data analysis. Um, and we're quite interested in regions that are currently underrepresented, such as South um, Asia and the Middle East, where we do also reflect on our research practices within sort of culturally sensitive um, ethical frameworks. Um, and very excited to be part of this webinar today. Thank you, Ian. Hi, I'm Ian Matheson. I'm an associate professor of genetics at the University of Pennsylvania. And my lab studies uh, the genetic basis of complex disease, both in living people and also using ancient DNA to try and understand that in ancient people, in particular, we look, use ancient DNA to look for evidence of recent natural selection and other types of evolution that contribute to differences in genetic architecture among individuals today. Maria. 
Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Maria Avila. I am a professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and the coordinator of the International Laboratory for Human Genome Research. I am a paleogenomicist. Uh, I am um, interested in ancient populations from the America, demographic history of Mexico, and to understand also the impact of colonization in shaping the genetic uh, structure of the people who live in Mexico. I'm also interested in pathogens, in the role of pathogens and, uh, and ancient epidemics and how they have impacted the genetic diversity of populations. And I'm also very interested in um, finding ways to, uh, to democratize the field of ancient genomics and to uh, bring up ideas to um, to make the field less uh, feel less uh, colonial. Um, yeah. So, yeah. The end of. Yes. Uh, hey, I'm the end of. I'm an assistant professor of genetics at Yale School of Medicine, and so my research focus on ancient DNA. Um, like mostly addressing like very similar question than everybody here, uh, but they have like also special focus on archaeological sediment, again, ancient DNA from archaeological sediment, so mostly ancient environmental DNA, and try to apply that approach to contexts where uh, skeletal remains are missing or not available. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Shai Karmi. Uh, I'm at the Faculty of Medicine at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I'm a statistical geneticist working in uh, various areas of uh, genetics, from theoretical population genetics to um, medical genetics and um, pre-implantation genetic testing. In uh, empirical population genetics, my focus uh, has been on uh, Jewish genetics and the genetics of the area of the Levant. David. Hi, I'm David Reif. Um, I uh, work on uh, methods for studying population history and also uh, have been working on trying to study biological adaptation over time. Um, we've been working on uh, producing um, ancient DNA data uh, in different parts of the world to make it possible to study population change over time in collaboration with uh, our uh, colleagues in the different places from which we're studying uh, uh, population history and, and adaptation. Um, and um, a focus in the last years has been um, on this topic of diversifying where the DNA that we analyze comes from. About two thirds of it has come from Western Eurasia, Europe and Western Asia, but about one third has been coming from other places, such as you showed in your map. And that proportion is increasing rapidly now. And that's uh, an exciting prospect. And Harold. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone from the afternoon in Leipzig. Um, I'm a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. Um, I'm a population geneticist who develops computational methods um, and analyzes ancient DNA datasets. Um, I'm very interested in detecting close and distant relatives and also use this to infer close skin and uh, recent demography. And more recently, I've been um, I'm, um, I'm about to start a ESC project um, on sequencing 500 medieval Black Death victims to get insights into um, human infectious disease selection. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we will get started with the first session, which is really just sort of getting a, a survey of where current ancient DNA research stands and how we got to this this point. Um, and so maybe I briefly mentioned uh, the distinction between ancient and historical DNA. And this is you know, something I've discussed with David before. And I just wanted to get people's thoughts about where you draw that line in terms of what you consider historical and ancient and what sort of different research questions can be addressed with these um, DNA from various um, uh, age ranges. So um, maybe, David, you can start. Yeah, the, the traditional idea of what history is, is the time of writing. That's the historical definition. So 
that's different times in different places. The earliest time of writing is probably in the Middle East about 5,000 years ago and shortly after in China around that time. And uh, other places writing is more recent. So uh, ancient and historical, uh, often we refer to things in the last hundreds of years as more historical and ancient is more than that in practice in this area. Um, I think uh, all time periods are potentially informative for understanding uh, how populations got to be how they are there to, to they are today and disease risk um, and for the different questions that can be useful to study different types of, of individuals. So for example, for the topic that Maria um, Avila mentioned, uh, colonial history and how colonialism affected people, that would be really a historical question. You would be wanting to study people who lived in the last hundreds of years. Anyone else or? Generally agree with that, um, that distinction. I mean, I'll just add to that to say, I think it, it also depends a little bit what sort of question you're trying to address. I think, you know, these very more recent time periods, we think there's really very little time for natural selection to have happened. So if you're really interested in the effects of selection, then you really need to longer time periods and, and not that selection can't happen over very short time periods, but we think those are sort of quite isolated incidents. So I think, again, if you're interested in sort of specific demographic questions, then you need to target those times. If you're interested more generally in learning about things like how natural selection operates in humans, then you really need a, a longer time scale. So I wanted to sort of look at how we got to this current state. So I showed the map of the published ancient DNA data. Um, and so we kind of understand how we got to the point with uh, data from existing populations, why there's sort of the bias in sort of the Western European, Northern European um, populations. But why does that map for ancient DNA look as it does in terms of overrepresentation of of Eurasia, Western Eurasia specifically, um, how we got to that point, it, what sort of practical, logistical, political, social um, issues uh, led to most of the ancient DNA uh, data being from those regions. David? Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. I think that there's several converging topics, but the biggest one is that the whole ancient DNA revolution started in Europe. And the laboratories that develop the technology in, in Germany and in, in uh, Denmark uh, and so on really were digging in their backyards. And there were large collections of human skeletal remains that had been collected over 150 years. And there was also a lot of uh, research support in Europe for studying these remains with these technologies. And so part of it is that just there was a massive head start. Uh, in terms of producing all of this data in Europe on the existing skeletal collections with support that was coming uh, from that source, from those sources. Um, so partly it's just that. Um, I think it's also partly the um, where there is uh, collections of skeletal material that are already excavated, which is variable in different parts of the world. Um, and also both due to preservation and also due to the history of collection. So, for example, in some parts of the Americas, like in uh, parts of uh, Mexico, for example, and others, there actually are pretty substantial skeletal collections, but there might maybe hasn't been enough study yet of some of those remains. In other parts, such as South Asia, there are not, or many parts of Western and Eastern and Central Africa, uh, there's maybe not as many collections. And so there also hasn't been as much invested in the archaeological material. Um, and in other cases, the preservation is poor because of the hotter climates. Uh, but even that is really beginning to be overcome or has already started to be overcome by better technology. So I think there's lots of prospect for being able to do these kinds of studies at, the, at, ver at, a, at a similarly ambitious way in many parts of the world. Maria? Um, yeah, I've, I've also given this a lot of thought, but I think also, I mean, if you if you do a similar map just with present day genomes, you have something similar, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's yeah, it can be related to the 
places that develop the methods. I agree with that. And also maybe a, a slight advantage of the weather in, in Eurasia compared to say Africa or like the tropics. But I think it's mostly a rep, like it's it's a reproduction of the uh, where the resources for for research and genomics research are uh, located, right? So there is definitely this global north global south divide, and I think what we are seeing is just a reflection of that. So how we are transporting those different. Uh, like power dynamics to different fields, uh, modern genomics and ancient genomics in this case. And I think that's that's also a part of it, in my opinion. Sarah? Yeah, I wonder if uh, those power dynamics get amplified even more um, in the because of the fact that there are very, very few places, very few labs that can actually do the data generation is my understanding for ancient DNA. Uh, it's very expensive to build the types of labs that are required to do that type of analysis. And there just isn't often the infrastructure, there isn't often the funds available to have those resources in the global south in some areas. And so we have to be thinking about, and even, even in you know, not just in the global south, there it can be very challenging to have the resources to do this kind of work. So then we have to think of solutions for how do we overcome that so that there's more equitable distribution of who's doing the research. And I don't know the answer exactly, but I'm wondering what others think. Mansa. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to, to Sarah's and David's and Maria's comment there that I think one thing to be cognizant of in terms of also what's driving a lot of this research right now is the pace that's being set by the global north, right? Because a lot of the funding, a lot of the labs, as Sarah said, a lot of the know-how is sitting, kind of it's being concentrated in some of these global north regions. Um, and so there's this idea of, well, if we don't work on these samples now, somehow we're going to miss the boat. Um, and I think this needs to be uh, something we think about as a field um, is, you know, how do we sort of come to equity without giving people um, in the global south a chance to actually, you know, be able to to build that infrastructure um, and sort of cut back on sort of more of these extractive processes that seem to suggest that this work can only currently be done in, in these few labs that sort of hold a lot of the resources in the field. Jessica? I can't find my raise hand button, but thank you. Um, I think that there's also an element to a disconnect between the questions that a lot of local communities actually have and the issues that they experience and the things they would like to explore with ancient DNA and, and the kinds of issues that you know can actually be studied. Um, and then the ones that are that are interesting to people who have maybe more funding or more um, potential to have a sort of a higher impact, less local type of, of uh, outcome. So I think there's a lot of communities who are really interested in the potential, but the questions that they have are not necessarily the ones that the researchers have. And so I don't know that that necessarily is the reason why there is um, such poor representation, I, I can speak mostly just for Africa and not even all of Africa, just mostly a, a small part of it. But I do, I have noticed that, that there's there's enthusiasm for it um, where I work, but that, um, you know, the kinds of questions when you actually just talk to people that they want to know about are not the same kinds of questions that the researchers usually have. So we... we... Sort of mentioned sort of resources and infrastructure that's sort of creating this bias. Is there any limitations, sort of ecological, technological, in which some regions of the world are just going to be undersampled because just the the quality of the available uh, samples or um, whether ecological conditions that make these uh, uh, more degraded than other regions of the world is new technology going to be able to address those um, those limits 
right? Or there's just some regions we'll never get good samples from, or certain time periods we'll never get good samples from um, because of those limitations. I know at the end of you've worked on like working on 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 looking at sediments in different places. Do you do you feel like we'll be able to overcome these limitations? Uh, actually, I'm 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 pretty much optimistic because like uh, as David uh, mentioned, is like I mean, ten years ago, people were thinking that it was impossible even to get like DNA from Africa and and stuff like that, and and we see that like. With the development of technique more and more sensitive, we kind of like now be able to generate data from those those places. But I think, like as Devin mentioned, I think like really I think the first barrier is very like just the archaeological records in those places of the world. I think I mean me especially working on like more uh, earlier time periods. It's it's very like I go to some places in Africa where there's just like honest like one archaeologist working in like the full on country, and those places I know that already the the DNA is not going to be well preserved. So I need to screen a lot of material to be able to find. But yes, like they they, they don't have any funding in those places for even to do archaeological words, uh, work. And uh, yeah, so I I think. This is definitely, I think, the main limitation uh, I had is really like finding people, finding, getting access to 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 samples, because I think like the technique are getting there, but we need like much more money to like screen and screen and screen big volume of data and more infrastructure, and uh, yeah. Maria. Yeah, yeah, um, I I agree as well that yeah there are some um, limitations based on like we know DNA degrades more like in tropical environments, but I agree with the end of that. I mean, we 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 can overcome those limits with with uh, newer methods and technologies. Uh, however, another limitation I could mention is it's I mean it goes back to the last uh, question you asked like these these disparities. Because you have, if you have local labs trying to to start uh, working on ancient DNA, or um, yeah, or just even collaborate with other groups uh, doing ancient DNA, you get this uh, very unequal uh, production of data from different labs. So again, you are uh, you have to uh, kind of. I mean, the, the pace from some labs is so fast, and that's also something that Mansa mentioned, right? So they're producing data at a very uh, fast pace. And when you start and you want to start something locally, you can't compete with that, right? Uh, so some archaeologists, uh, local archaeologists, might prefer working with people from abroad than uh, locally as well. And that I feel that that also can slow the local progress and building the local capacity and infrastructure to to be more kind of independent and sustainable in in this kind of of studies. So that's also something I think that influences these disparities. Mm -hmm. David, I I agree with everything that people have said. One thing this reminded me of a little bit is that because the in some places in the world, for example, I know a lot the situation in Kenya and Tanzania, where I've collaborated with a, a lot of people and several studies, and the existing collections of remains that are amenable to this kind of analysis over the time period ancient DNA can study is very small and has been mostly studied at this point. And so it reminds me a little bit of the history of uh, adoption of mobile phone usage in, for example, India or parts of Africa where they leapfrogged the fixed line technology and went directly to mobile phone usage. There's the future of ancient DNA, I think, in 10 years is going to be new excavation directly for new material. Uh, because what's been happening in the last 10 years is people have been going through existing collections um, and sampling material that's been accumulated over time. But I think there's a really amazing opportunity in places like Kenya and Tanzania and Malawi and other places to do new excavation, like, for example, Jess and Diendo are doing in, in Malawi um, and so on, specifically for a whole series of bio, bio archaeological studies, which could include DNA, 
um, and uh, could provide, like, which would support archaeological studies that produce this type of data. I think that's really promising, and I think it's actually going to spread eventually to the global north, um, because that's what the most interesting type of new work will happen. So maybe it's actually a chance to pioneer something in some parts of the world uh, where you can actually carry out collaborative studies of local archaeologists and genome scientists and foreign people who are interested to carry out more engaged studies to produce material that would be useful for these studies. Yeah, that was something I was wondering about because the map I showed was about the data that has been generated. And I was wondering where current samples exist that have not been processed, sequenced. Um, what kind of are those collections? Who has um, provenance over them? Where are these untapped sources of ancient and historical DNA? Where are they currently? Are they also just mostly in uh, Europe and Western Eurasia, or are there other places that just people have not gotten to, they don't have the resources to generate data from? Or is it really the case that we just have to find right new sources, dig up new sources uh, of data, right? So just wondering like where, what is the current state in terms of, you know, if there was a magic pot of money, uh, new data that could be sequenced? Jessica? I can um, certainly speak to the situation in, in Malawi, at least, where we, um, we're kind of at the limit of, of every individual that's ever been uh, excavated by an archaeologist, I should say. But in, in qualifying that, that is, um, there's a lot of, there's, there are a lot of archaeological sites that are actively under destruction, and local communities are not happy about it, but they also don't have the resources to ameliorate that. So you have cemeteries, historical cemeteries that are eroding bones everywhere. People would love to be able to um, do something about that, but they aren't resourced to be able to. So they don't and can't. And so it's not necessarily a limitation uh, of availability, I guess, of, of, of sort of if we're talking about human skeletal elements, uh, or even the limitation on the desires of communities to be able to, um, you know, to do something with them and learn something from them, but it's more just logistical. And then the other thing that we found is that when we go back to a lot of the same rock shelters and we do brand new excavations, we find that, you know, the archaeologists who were excavating there in the 50s and the 60s were finding and focusing on a complete inhumation, for example. So if you want to count those individuals, there might be maybe seven total. And, and they're not even that complete. But when you actually start looking at very, very careful detailed excavations, suddenly you're looking uh, at more like 70, 80, 100 plus individuals because they're all represented by say one small piece. It's all mixed together in these rock shelters. They've never been given the attention or the care excavating them in that way. And so suddenly you actually find that there are a lot of individuals that are ancient individuals. And then that comes up against this other problem of, well, certainly if it's a destructive analysis and each individual is represented by one small fragment, you don't want to go around destroying and screening every one of those small fragments just in case. So there has to be some sort of plan made in there. So I think there's a lot more um, availability if there's more work done, but also if there's more careful work done at a lot of the same sites. And so we don't just want to look at the historical literature and say, oh, well, it looks like there aren't that many sets of remains here, because actually there are, um, if you just approach the actual excavation a little bit differently. Harold? Yeah, um, regarding the question of, of some um, where are untapped resources, um, I would argue it's hugely heterogeneic. Um, it's in, um, in the European Middle Age, um, you could go to every bigger city and look at the old medieval church and you will find probably thousands or even ten thousands of skeletons where really money and scientific interest is the limit. Um, but generally, the older you go, if you, you know, see Neanderthal, um, it would be probably very hard to <laughs> sequence many more high quality Neanderthal genomes because there are very, very few, very, very precious specimens. Um, so yeah, no, it really depends. Um, and um, I would also say a lot of, of interesting potential is often um, museum um, curators um, who are often 
were quite critical of ancient DNA work. So there are rather large museum collection in some parts of the world that so far hasn't been accessible to ancient DNA um, research because yes, the ancient DNA is partially destructive. Um, but I would argue there is um, definitely potential there. So given this heterogeneity in terms of where these untapped resources are, what are sort of the, the trade-offs in sampling densely within one region, right? Versus uh, sampling more broadly uh, across time, right? Given limited resources, right? Um, what, what are the benefits in terms of how uh, deep or broad uh, spatially or temporally you you generate new data? Aria? Yeah, so I think um, I I would like to, I mean, and this can be like an open question as well for, for everyone, but it sounds to me that people are thinking more on like we need samples and we need to cover every uh, corner of the world and then we will like find out things and discover new things based on all these samples and and we are missing information from this side so we need access to samples from but that's that's one approach um that uh i feel that that's kind of where, where we're getting here but i prefer personally a different one where we are like located in a geographical place and we say what are the questions that are important here and then we start to build like like bottom up instead of top down um so in that like under that different framework it's not like oh we need to like these many samples it's okay what are the questions and then according to those questions that we have we can define and i would say a minimum number of individuals and or samples that will allow us to answer this set of questions because this kind of top-down approach of let's sample everywhere and then we will come with information and we'll make sense of it to me i don't know it doesn't feel quite right to me but i i mean I, i'm happy to hear other uh, people's thoughts so i wouldn't see it as just like on top resources i would see okay maybe we haven't uh, like we haven't found the right questions in each of these places to be answered with ancient DNA uh, because of many uh, reasons, some of, of those we have discussed here. And maybe that's a different angle. I don't know what, what others think. I don't know if it made sense, but I just said. Yeah, um, Mansa, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just kind of want to echo what Maria said. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I sort of want to say this in, in good faith, but I, I do find the, the the term or the phrase untapped resources a little condescending because we are talking here about people's ancestors, you know, cultural patrimony of, of different regions. And so to, to us scientists, maybe those are data points, but they're actually, you know, the people, their, their heritage, they're part of, of people's ancestry. So um, I think, um, Again, this comes back to the point about what is really driving a lot of this motivation and the fact that perhaps we've maybe reached some sort of a milestone with, let's say, ancient DNA in Europe, um, and we're sort of kind of ready to leapfrog into into follow up questions, you know, does that really mean we have to dictate the same pace in other regions of the world where we, you know, and, and plus, let's back up a little that uh, a lot of the samples for ancient DNA are not really our field. That's the field of archaeology and, um, you know, and and sort of the, the patrimony of local indigenous populations. Um, and so instead of ancient DNA trying to be that sort of quote unquote bait to, to bring these samples out of their untapped sort of regions, as we're trying to kind of put it here, I think we need to kind of back up and be respectful and give time and space to uh, the people who are actually directly, uh, you know, related to these, these remains in, in some ways, including the archaeological community. Shai? Hi. Um, I think there is value and room for both uh, kind of broad studies of uh, small samples from many different places and um, studies more focused on a specific region with uh, like very dense sampling of very large sample sizes. Um, like if you're if you're doing a study in a specific place with a very large sample, like like 
the one Harald proposed, for example, uh, you can find a lot of things that you cannot find when just sample uh, two or three people. Uh, for example, you can find uh, relatives and reconstruct uh, pedigrees, and you can see what uh, what life looked like for for these people. Um, and you can also see rare events, rare variants, uh, maybe rare diseases that are reflected in the skeletal remains. Uh, it is also possible to to estimate that frequency much more accurately when the sample size is large, which is uh, very important for understanding uh, natural selection and uh, also understanding. Uh, also, it's also important downstream for medical genetics. Um, so, for example, to follow up on Harold's study, I mean, if if he has a very large sample. Uh, of people both from before and after the Black Death, then, then we can tell uh, exactly what was the change in uh, frequency of variance uh, due to this uh, event. Um, and I think sometimes large sample sizes are just important because sometimes you just miss things if you have a small sample. Um, and to give an example, in our uh, study of the uh, medieval Jewish cemetery in Erfurt, uh, Germany, uh, we found unexpectedly that there were two nearly distinct communities living in that uh, cemetery, in that uh, city. Um, and this is something that we could only discover with some confidence because we had uh, we started with a sample size of around 30 people. Um, so it can really answer questions that are much, um, or, or um, teach us about history in, in higher resolution, if, if possible, if the samples are, are there and if we have the resources to sample them and to uh, to sequence and, and analyze them. Uh, but of course, there's also value in uh, uh, studying um, ancient DNA very broadly around the world and in different periods. Ian, you had your hand up. Well, yes, I mean, I actually, I think Shai said most of what I was about to say, but I think, you know, t from my perspective, generally speaking, if you're interested in questions about demographic history, then one should sample as broadly as possible. If you're interested in questions about genetic architecture, broadly defined, then one really needs very large samples um, from a single population. And so, again, as others have expressed, I think the kind of study design needs to be um, uh, uh, driven not just by the sort of specific questions, but also the kind of general class of questions that you're, you're planning on, on answering. Uh, Jessica. Thinking about this issue of you know of resources, I agree that that feels strange when we're talking about you know the remains of people. But I guess thinking more broadly about potential sources of ancient DNA, and especially knowing that in the African context, a lot of the um, you know the diseases and the health issues, because I think that's the main focus here, is. Uh, you know, that people face are really because of disease vectors. And um, that, I feel, doesn't mean that we have to restrict, you know, ourselves to thinking about ancient human skeletal uh, parts or, or ancient human remains, even um, thinking more about what potential is there for exploring um, the evolutionary trajectory of disease vectors and their co-evolution and co-expansion with major demographic expansions alongside people technological expansions, the um, emergence in the African context and spread of the Iron Age, so-called, and metalworking technology and the Bantu expansion, and what's the relationship that that has to the impacts people are feeling today from uh, various disease vectors, and then also potentially, you know, actually using some of, of those as sources of, of ancient DNA, um, or thinking about uh, livestock and the movement of livestock with people and commensals, and and then of course also just alternative, completely alternative sources than destroying human tissue like sediment uh, DNA. Uh, it's it's not really been tried, um, <laughs> and and it would be wonderful to know if that could work. You know, in in a number of different contexts across Africa or. Uh, lots and lots and lots of ornaments that people used to wear against their bodies for a long period of time in many, many archeological collections that have probably got human cells in them, but would be extremely difficult to uh, work with. But maybe thinking about new excavations where, you know, like has recently been done in Europe, uh, you know, those sorts of personal ornaments could become sources of, of ancient human DNA. And I just don't know as an archaeologist what the technological limitations might be, but it already feels a little bit like science fiction. So I feel optimistic. <laughs>
<laughs> there are many, many other places we might look other than human skeletal tissues. Before we wrap up this session soon, um, but I just want to highlight this point about resources and how we approach them, because there's this inherent tension and it applies broadly in terms of when we're generating a resource, we want it to be as broadly useful, applicable to as many people, as beneficial to as many people as possible, right? Um, so creating a, a large, uh, diverse resource on the one hand. But again, I, I agree that it also has to be driven by what are the local needs of the community that is providing that resource and generating the materials for that resource. And I think this is a topic we'll get into the next session uh, after the break. Uh, but I do want to get to at least like a couple questions in the Q&A uh, before we take a, a short break. Um, so one of the questions has to do Given that there are these limited um, infrastructure and capacity in different regions of the world, what is the benefit um, with engaging uh, with those uh, research communities and perhaps even participant communities um, uh, with ancient DNA research? How do you do you approach that given the, the current limitations and resources and capacity um, of those regions? And this is for, for anyone. Many of you have worked with uh, uh, different communities around the world. How how do you approach that disparity in the resources that you have yourself and those uh, communities that you engage with? Uh, Aria? Yeah. Um, well, if I can start by saying something. So when we talk about engaging with communities, we, we can be a bit more specific what we mean by that. Uh, but um, like a general point I can say is that it takes a long time, right? It's not uh, it's not something you can do uh, like in a few months or even a couple of years. Usually uh, this real engagement with communities when you're going to use their ancestors' uh, remains requires building a long relationship and involving them in the research questions and discussing the progress throughout, it's it's really something that takes a uh, long time. And I guess it's uh, it, it depends what your positionality is as a researcher in respect to the place you are studying. I guess uh, that uh, that can vary between uh, between projects depending where you're at. Um, my my approach was when I came back to Mexico was to to really start building trust with archaeologists and at a slow pace, like starting with small pilot projects and then like showing them the benefit of this kind of relationship. And right now I'm like more than, I don't know, eight years uh, in that I have collaborated with, with archaeologists since I came back to Mexico and that I only feel now that we have like this very strong um relationship that allows developing projects further, right? Maybe that's that's how things work locally here, uh, I believe. And um, it's a different pace from what I've seen uh, elsewhere. And it's just that nothing is the right or wrong approach. I just think it's different um, in different places. Diendo? Yes, so I just want to add also that um, uh, we also need to like think about like way of like training people in those parts of like locally. Uh, there's definitely like uh, when I've been like traveling to different places, I also went to like visit some labs and like the, the type of infrastructure that they have. And there's definitely like ways at least to implement uh, parts of a pipeline that can be like done there uh, locally. But uh, it's also important to have people there that actually knows what we are doing. So we need to also like invest times and probably money to train like local researcher or like local students. There are definitely a lot of talented students also in those parts of the world, but they don't have like access to, to learn about the new techniques and things like that. So we probably need like, I don't know, like more scholarship right, to make those, like, some students traveling to our lab here to get the training that that they need to, yeah, eventually in the future also be able to themselves develop this, like, the full-on pipeline uh, locally. 
Sarah. Yeah, just following up on that, um, training, super important. And one thing, I, I mean, if we're being realistic, again, we're talking about ancient DNA here, it may be a, very challenging to have the infrastructure to generate the data locally, given the expenses and the types of labs needed. But one thing people can do is analyze that data, and they can take a lead role in that wherever they are. And so I think the bioinformatics, the you know training, statistical genetics training is absolutely critical. And that, uh, you know, we haven't even, and one other thing that we haven't talked about yet are the other logistics that are involved with collecting these samples in global regions, which have to do also with getting the permits. I don't know how it works with ancient DNA. I have to go through very rigorous ethical review. And I'm actually curious, I'd like to hear from the people who study ancient DNA, how does that work? And do you also go through like ethical review? And then we have to go through multiple rounds of trying to get permits. And the government has to also agree that this is, you know, something that they want to be done. And they're always going to say, how are you building the local infrastructure? How are you building up locally? Now, one way could be training. There could be other ways as well. So I, I'd also be curious to hear about that. I think we can get to some of those questions in the next session in terms of uh, working with communities, um, diversifying the resources. Um, but right now, we're going to take a very brief break. Um, we will return in five minutes after the hour. Um, so 11.05 Eastern, um, we'll get to that second session. And then the, the last, the third session, I think we'll really get into some more of the science in terms of the scientific questions that we can address with uh, different types of, of data. But I will see everyone very shortly after a brief break. <laughs> 